I am pleased to, to introduce our program moderator for this evening, Mr. Marvin Kalb. Marvin Kalb has had a distinguished 30-year broadcast career working for both CBS News and NBC News, where he served as chief diplomatic correspondent, also as Moscow bureau chief, and as moderator of Meet the Press. Mr. Kalb was the founding director of the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press Politics and Public Policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He is currently a writer in residence at the US Institute of Peace. He is a presidential fellow at the George Washington University, as well as Edward R. Murrow Professor Emeritus at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Please welcome our moderator, Marvin Kalb. Thank you, Thank you very much, Gloria. Thank you, and good evening, and welcome to this special event with two very special people, Madeleine Albright and George Shultz, both having served as Secretary of State, Albright with President Clinton, and Shultz with President Reagan. Our conversation tonight will focus on war and peace building. Rarely in American history have we been confronted with so many daunting challenges, not only the economic challenges which are daunting enough, but in addition to wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the threats of global terrorism, nuclear proliferation, and climate change. There are flickerings of good news, the communications revolution inspiring political hope around the world. We will all remember, I think, what happened in Iran last summer. And there are organizations such as the United States Institute of Peace, which is actually trying to turn these hopes into reality. So what's realistic? What's possible? What should our priorities be at this crucial moment in our history? Who better to ask than Secretaries of State George Shultz and Madeleine Albright? Secretary Shultz served in both the Nixon and Reagan administrations, with Nixon as Secretary of Labor, with Reagan as Secretary of State. He played a key role in framing a foreign policy that led ultimately to the end of the Cold War. A PhD in industrial economics, he has taught at MIT, at Chicago, and at Stanford. Secretary Albright served in the Carter and Clinton administrations, with Carter on his National Security Council staff, and with Clinton as his UN ambassador, and then as the first woman to serve as Secretary of State. A PhD in public law and government, she teaches at Georgetown, and chairs a global strategy investment firm. You've all noticed, no doubt, that Schultz worked for Republican presidents and Albright for Democratic presidents. We are, as usual, balancing the ticket, or at least trying to. No, Bernie, you don't know something. No, no, Marvin, There's first a, of all. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's a little club of former secretaries of state. Uh -huh. We've We're got two of the each best. Other. <laughs> I'm going to start by assuming that you're both back in government and therefore back in power, though that does not necessarily follow. What? <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> what would be your absolute overriding priority? What would you get up in the morning thinking, this is a problem that I simply must solve today? And how would you go about doing it? We'll start with Secretary Schultz. The first thing I would do is say, to be effective around the world, we must be strong at home. We must get our house in order. For decades, we have been spending more than we earn, and it's gotten totally out of control. We're losing respect. So we have to get control of ourselves. So that's number one, and number two, we have to do better on the energy problem and learn how to use alternatives to oil and coal, deal with the carbon problem, and get control of ourselves on that basis. With that kind of a stance, strength, then we work, and I would like to see, as you probably realize, hard work in trying to get ourselves to a world free of nuclear weapons. Okay. I might say 
that President Obama is doing a very important and strong job in that regard. And I'm very impressed with what he's doing in that. But Mr. Secretary, field. you've mentioned a couple of very important issues, no doubt. But how would you go about doing it? I mean, for example, on the economic uh, front, many people have talked about the need to do this. But very few people have done it. And what I'm asking you is, how would you do it? Well, it's been done before. I hate to say it, but we inherited an economic mess when uh, President Reagan took office. And it got straightened out. It can get straightened out. The key is economic growth. Okay. Adopt policies that give you economic growth. That's what will generate revenue. Combine it with control of spending. We have to get our Social Security system back on track. Conceptually, it's easy. It's clear what the problem is and how to deal with it. And we need to get the political gumption to do it. The Political biggest problem in spending out of control, however, is the health area. And there, it's a harder problem, but I think very doable. Okay. Secretary Albright, your burning issue of the day, and how would you go about handling it? Well, what I find interesting is that my good friend, Secretary Schultz, as one would presume that we would return as secretaries of state, has in fact addressed issues that are uh, the combination of domestic and foreign policy. And I think that is one of the major aspects of what we're dealing with, is that it's very hard to separate the foreign from domestic policy, which means that uh, we, if I were there, I would think that we would have to do a better job of explaining to the American people the combination of these problems. The other part, if you look at the issues that uh, Dick mentioned and you mentioned is the plethora of them. And what I think is the biggest problem is that we don't anymore have the international institutional structure to deal with it. Um, that in fact there is not confidence in any of the institutions that are out there, including domestic institutions and then the foreign institutions. People, I'm a great advocate of the UN. Does it really work at this point? There's a real question on that. I was just asked to uh, head a group of experts looking at a new strategic concept for NATO. I believe in NATO. Is it really the alliance that is going to take us into the future? What happens in Afghanistan? Do the international financial institutions work? For me, one of the biggest problems in problem solving is, in fact, who does it? What are the institutional structures? I can discuss the individual issues. If I were you know, I'd, if there were a lottery every day about what's the biggest problem in the world, I would say Pakistan. Mm -hmm. It has everything that gives you an international migraine. So, um, you know, I think all the issues are collected there. I would spend a lot of time on that and a regional solution to what's going on in Afghanistan. But any one of the issues that you've mentioned or George mentioned, and the worst issue is looking at how the worst weapons, nuclear weapons, that they don't get into the hands of the worst people, the terrorists. So the, that's kind of it. And I think most of us listening to both of you would agree with everything that you've said. But it seems to me that nothing is really going to happen unless there is presidential leadership married to congressional cooperation. And at the moment in Washington, where I live, there is however you define it, political paralysis, political warfare. How are we going to make any progress in this kind of climate? What has to be done? Secretary Schultz. Well, come on out to California. The government's <laughs> great out here. <laughs> I think Let's stick in Washington for a minute. <laughs> well, I don't know the answer to your question. But I have a sense that sometimes divided government works better than one party or the other has it all its way. I thought the second Clinton term was very good. And the reason why it may work better is that everybody knows that you can't get anywhere unless you find solutions that are broadly agreeable. It tends to push consensus and tells people that that's the way they have to work. Maybe we'll get something like that if the 
Congress is a little more balanced after the next election. Well, I definitely can't go along with that. Uh, yeah. uh, you mean you want it all Republican? No. <laughs> but I think that we do. We have a divided government at the moment. I think that is part of the problem in terms of a sense that, the, I mean, I've been in the opposition, uh, and so I know what it's like. It's actually more fun when you're not. And the, the bottom line, though, is, is that I think that there is not a sense of trying to find the bipartisan solution. I mean, George mentioned we have this small club. Um, the truth is most of the former secretaries of state at the moment are Republicans, but we have spent a great deal of time together looking at joint solutions because, in fact, we have faced similar problems together. And I think that is the kind of thing that needs to be seen. It does not a matter of if you're a Democrat or Republican that you don't have the best interests of the country um, at really in mind and in heart, but it's not happening. And it goes to the point that I made is I don't think there's confidence in institutions at the moment. If you look at the polling numbers, Congress's numbers are very far down, and I think there is this anti-incumbent feeling, which I think is unfortunate. Well, there's this question that I've just been given. Do you ever want to give up because it's so hard, and it's offered by Alyssa, who was aged nine? <laughs> and she's already got the message, so. No, I think no. they are overstating it. This will get righted. And I think the fact of the matter is that people broadly see, never mind the people in Washington, out around the country, regardless of party, there is a general perception that it's not working. And That's right. that we're going to have to do better. And we'll get that point through to the people who are in charge. But Mr. And Secretary, we've known that now for the last two, at least, presidential elections, and it hasn't gotten through yet. What has to happen? There are a lot of people who genuinely feel that some utter catastrophe must first happen to galvanize the American people into recognizing how serious the problem is and therefore doing something about it. There is an utter catastrophe hitting us right now. It's the runaway spending, not only at the federal level, but at the state and local level. And I think people are perceiving it and saying we have to get control of ourselves. That's why I said at the beginning that getting control of ourselves is a key. And you have to do that so you have a strong base on which to work on all the problems that you talked about. I. I Alyssa, I hope, would never give up, because I think that part of what the American spirit is about is not giving up. And, and I, I think that we feel this, the chances of us returning to office are like zero. But the bottom line <laughs> is that there is something magical about public service and the possibility of trying to make a difference in these issues. And, and I think that the assumption that I make is that the people in various offices are actually trying to do something about it. But it is very, very difficult. And I think we should turn the problem to where it really belongs, is to the media. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, I, I usually the end up. The first time I heard that was during the Nixon administration. No, I, let me yes. just say something. What I think is very important to solve the issues is to have an educated and informed citizenship citizenry. That is what democracy is about. Right. And unless we figure out some way for people to use this bountiful amount of information in some way to understand things rather than to be riled up by it, um, I think that is one of the major problems. I usually get there at the end of a discussion, So, but I thought since you were... Um, I, I think it's a genuine issue. And what is so interesting is we have more information than we've ever had. And this may surprise you, but I actually listen to right-wing radio when I drive, and it's amazing that I haven't run over somebody. <laughs> um, but it is basically just elicits anger from a certain group, of whatever, whether you're right or left on it. And so I do think that there is a genuine responsibility that the media is not fulfilling. And since this is co-sponsored by the Shorenstein Center, I think it's a very important point that we need to deal with. And it may surprise you, but I agree with everything you've said. <laughs> uh, 
moving on. <laughs> um, a key thing, it would seem to me, is how do we strengthen our diplomacy? Um, I am mindful of the fact that a year ago, Secretary of Defense Gates was the one who said he would give some of the Pentagon budget to the State Department to strengthen its role in problem solving around the world. Now, we've heard about diplomacy being a kind of soft art, a smart way of accomplishing your aim. Why is diplomacy now, at least the appearance of it, why does it seem so inadequate to the tasks before us? Secretary Schultz. First of all, because we haven't devoted the resources that are needed to support the State Department and the building up of resources there. Second, I think we should do a better job of seeing to it that the senior people stay. We have <clears throat> experienced foreign service officers retiring at the age of 50 and so on. That's when they're at the top of their game. We've got to keep them there and keep working because we have to conduct a global diplomacy. And you need first class people and many of them to do it. But why doesn't then the Congress I think why we, doesn't the Congress do that? I mean that should be an easy thing. Well, I think it's getting easier and the, and I think Secretary Clinton, as did Secretary Rice, as did Secretary Powell, have gradually moved the budget up. But the fact that the Secretary of Defense has to be uh, has to be uh, uh, carrying our water it tells you that there's a long ways to go. But I think there's also something else. There's a tendency, whenever there is a big and important problem, to have a special envoy go do it. Or when you have an important post, the very well qualified foreign service officer doesn't necessarily get to do that job. So in a sense, you're taking the people who've made a profession out of dealing with these issues somewhat out of the action. And I think we need to keep them in the action, not just analyze and report, but do the work of diplomacy. That is necessary. Um, am I listening to criticism of President Obama's decision to place special envoys in key trouble spots around the world? like Holbrook in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Mitchell in the Middle East. Is that what you're saying to us? To a certain extent, but it isn't, it's something that has grown over time. It isn't a unique thing at present. And it's also true of uh, ambassadorial posts. I think that uh, it's important that some of these posts be open to foreign service officers so that you, you have the chance for the professional people to move up into important roles. Let me take just a moment now to remind our audience that you're all listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Our speakers today are former Secretaries of State, Adeline Albright, George Schultz. We're discussing the challenges facing the nation. I'm Marvin Kalb, and I'd like to ask you both, starting with Secretary Albright. We're old enough to remember that there was this great phrase about politics stopping at the water's edge. And that we always lived with an assumption that when it came to foreign policy, we're all in it together. But now it seems that there is a Republican foreign policy and a Democratic foreign policy, and there's even a joke in Washington that it will be very good for President Obama's policy in Afghanistan if the Democrats lose a great deal this November and the Republicans win because they'll be more supportive of the war. What is this business about two foreign policies and isn't it dangerous for the country? Well, I, I do believe that we need to have a bipartisan foreign policy. Right. And I worked on that. A lot of people might have been surprised that I actually was very good friends and worked with Jesse Helms. Um, it, he was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. There were a series of issues that we had to do and I, I believe in that. Um, but I, it goes to the point that we've made now a couple of times, which is basically kind of a lack of sense of uh, where the, what we can do to help the country instead of just helping ourselves. And, and I do think that uh, there has to be, I, I believe that President Obama 
has done more to reach out to the other party uh, in order to try to develop this kind of a policy. And in Washington, I, I, I'm trying not to be overly partisan and just stating this, but Senator McConnell basically is Mr. No. And so that doesn't help in terms of this. And through a number of organizations, whether it's the U.S. Institute or I'm on the board of the Council on Foreign Relations, we've been trying to figure out how to get to a bipartisan foreign policy. It is very confusing to our friends and enemies uh, what exactly is going on. So I think this is a, a moment. But can I go back to something that Secretary of Schultz course. said? Is on the issue of, I teach a course. I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. That's all it is. So I teach a course called the National Security Toolbox. And as we are still the most powerful country in the world, you look in the toolbox and there's not a lot in there. You have diplomacy, uh, bilateral and multilateral. You have the economic tools, the sanctions, negative sanctions and embargoes and positive trade and aid. And you have the threat of the use of force, the use of force, intelligence and law enforcement. That's it, there's not a lot. And as you look at problems, you have to kind of pick out the tools and mix and match. One of the most interesting things that I teach about is the relationship that Secretary Schultz had with Secretary Weinberger over the questions of use of force and who does what when. It is something that has been going on a very long time. We are at war. We have two wars. So at the moment, it seems that it is easy enough to say that the Pentagon, especially since some of my successors turned over a lot of power to the Pentagon, that it is hard to get some of it back for the State Department. The budgets, you look at the budgets, the, state, the Pentagon has something like 580 billion, and the State Department has 58 billion. So it is that kind of a problem that is being dealt with, and there has to be that recalibration. And I fully agree with Secretary Schultz in terms of having uh, the diplomats have more power. I'm not sure I fully agree about eliminating totally political um, diplomats. The uh, special the spe envoys. No, well, not the special. We were all, we were political appointees. You know, I, I no, think No, but I'm I, thinking about people like the, Holbrook. The special envoys, let me just say, this is also a very practical issue, and it has to do with the divided government, which is that I can tell you that it's hard to get confirmation for uh, a variety of people in the posts of ambassadors, and so the special envoys don't need that. And um, Secretary Clinton and President Obama needed to get started on what was going on in the Middle East and um, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Secretary Schultz, the appearance of the United States in Afghanistan, for example, is very much khaki in color. Um, the top man is now General Petraeus, very admired experienced. He's the boss. He's the viceroy. Even the American ambassador is a former general. And the question that comes up is the generals themselves tell us that in Afghanistan, even in Iraq, they were saying that the ultimate compromise is a political one and that you can put tons of additional troops into Afghanistan, and you're not going to win the war. So what is holding this up? Why is it that we appear to be so linked to a military appearance and therefore a military outcome, or so it seems? What would be your judgment of that? Well, I think in Afghanistan, we have to get the concept right. And I don't think we're there yet. I felt myself that we went into Afghanistan in 2001, I guess it was, and we had a brilliant success. Why? We had a small footprint. We made common cause with local tribal groups, and they wanted the same things we did. Yes. We were able to use our comparative advantage effectively, and we got what we wanted. We got control. Then, at least as I see it, our mission morphed into trying to create an Afghanistan that had never been there before. That is a country 
with a central government, democratically elected, that has an army that can keep stability. That's not Afghanistan. We've got to get back to the notion that it's a bottoms-up country. And I think General Petraeus understands that, and I have the feeling that as the policies in Afghanistan work themselves through, it's going to look something like that. Now we have a huge problem that we haven't thought through strategically. We're working at it tactically. It comes because the nature of the warfare we are experiencing is different. Our adversaries don't wear uniforms. Our adversaries use inexpensive weapons to create chaos. Sure. Our adversaries implant themselves in civilian places like hospitals and schools and mosques and so on. And they fire from there, and if you fire back, you cause a lot of so-called collateral damage that you have a hard time with. So you meet that with rules of engagement that, in effect, take our comparative advantage away from us. We can't, it's hard to use our drones to fire back at something so because you, you create. a situation like that? Well, that's what we have to think through. And you mean it may be that we can't win? No, it may be that we have to have some different strategies and tactics to deal with a different kind of warfare. I might say that this problem is pervasive, and we're going to face it everywhere. Okay. Where, where if we, I mean, we, we go to Afghanistan, we go to Iraq, well, what are we going to do in Yemen? What are we going to do in Somalia? And so on and so on and so on. They're endless places. Okay. Secretary Albright, let me just pick up one of the points that Secretary Schultz was talking about. Do you believe that winning is possible in Afghanistan? Because the president did say that we had to win there. First of all, I think someday I'm going to teach a course on the unintended consequences of foreign policy decisions. And um, the Afghan story is a very long one that actually began many several centuries ago. But uh, I can track it from the Carter administration sure. reaction to the Soviet invasion to the Reagan administration providing Stinger missiles and a variety mm -hmm. of issues. So it has been going on a while. And you talked about the stunning initial victory. We took our, uh, or the Bush administration took the eye off the ball and went to Iraq. So uh, there are any number of reasons of what is going on. I think the following thing, and this is why I said that Pakistan was so important. I think it, we can win in terms of trying to limit the extent of the um, terrorist activities if we deal with Pakistan, and I think see it as a regional issue. What winning has been defined as is trying to get rid of al-Qaeda. And according to things that one has heard, uh, we are doing pretty well in getting ourselves rid of al-Qaeda. I agree with you in terms of it has to be a bottom-up. I do think that General Petraeus's um, approach to insurgency is something that has great um, validity in the Afghan issue. But I think the only way that we're going to be able to deal with Afghanistan is through a regional solution, which means dealing with Pakistan and India and trying to, to see it as a regional issue. We have not talked at all as yet about Israel and the Arab states. And there's a question from the audience, quote, is it possible to achieve peace in the Middle East during the current realm of the Obama administration? And I think that the, the author of that question probably has in mind that there has been significant, there have been significant differences apparent between Israel and the United States. Uh, but there has been the most recent effort on the part of the two leaders to straighten things out. Get to the main point. Secretary Schultz, you were there. You were there in the 80s when things were very rough. I was and when there two weeks ago. You were there two weeks ago. <laughs> the thing that I'm trying to get at is looking back over the last 30 years or so and putting your own experience right there for us now. What do we have to do? I keep stressing this. What 
what can we do to actually make peace more achievable between the Israelis and the Arabs? I think we want to build on the good things that are taking place. Okay. And there are two of them that are important. Whatever you may think about the Iraq war, we are where we are. And where we are is Saddam Hussein is not there, and there at least is a reasonable chance that there can emerge in Iraq a government that's reasonably representative, where Shia, Shiite, and Kurds somehow manage to get along somewhat. They are essentially a wealthy country, and if they can get their act together, all of a sudden you'll have something in the Middle East, in the Arab world, that's never been there before. And I think that will be important. It will drive Iran crazy, because Right next door would be a country that respected uh, the will of the people, and it's obvious that their own regime doesn't. So that's one thing. The other thing that struck me when I was in Israel recently, I had the opportunity to meet with the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, a man named Fayad. He is doing very interesting work on the West Bank. The, there is economic growth on the West Bank, economic institutions, financial institutions, political institutions are forming. And with the help of a really brilliant three-star general, there are security institutions developing. So I would try to nourish these two things, and particularly try to connect what's happening in the West Bank with the negotiations that people are trying to get underway. And it's interesting to me that the developments in the West Bank are being supported by Jordan. And to the extent you can keep Jordan involved, then you have a state to deal with that can help the Palestinians so I would be nourishing that development, which I think is quite promising. Secretary Elbright, how does one actually, when you are secretary and you're trying to do this, how do you nourish that kind of small growth, that seedling? How do you do it? I mean, this I've been covering this now for almost 50 years, and every time you get close to something, um, a couple of bad guys throw a few grenades here and there. They kill some people. Governments have to defend themselves. And then suddenly everything is thrown into a cocked hat. So how do you manage this kind of thing as a Secretary of State? I think it goes back to your question about diplomacy. For instance, there is a story on the front page of the New York Times today about the living conditions in Gaza. Right. And it does talk about exactly what Saman Fayyad is doing on the West Bank and saying that the people in Gaza don't like what's going on in the West Bank. I think through diplomacy, what should happen is the Arab world <coughs> needs to uh, be more helpful on trying to bring the Palestinian people together uh, and trying and working through different, we encouraging the Saudis and others to try to sort out some of the issues in Gaza. We can't do it all by ourselves. And I think that in the experiences that we had at Camp David, for instance, I wish that we had been able to spend more time getting what were known as the moderate Arabs to be more supportive of some of the proposals that have been made by Ehud Barak that then the Palestinians would have support to accept those. So I think that the diplomatic subtext of this is very important. I actually would try to figure out some way. I find one of the most interesting countries at the moment is Turkey. Turkey is, uh, is in a fight with Israel at the moment. On the other hand, they have a very interesting influence in the whole region. And there has to be more buy-in by other countries um, in the region. The problem that you mention is there is always somebody who has a stake in not having peace. 
And the question is how you get those in power to be able to, to get above that and criticize those that have done the grenade or whatever and keep going um, through. That was the brilliance of Yitzhak <coughs> Rabin, that we, he kept saying we had to negotiate as if there were no terrorism and fight terrorism. Um, as if we weren't trying to negotiate, so that you have to do both at the same time. One of the issues let that me go we back to, let me go back, however, to the example I gave. And a reason why I think it's so worthwhile to try to build on it. I spoke to the people involved the day after the Flotilla incident. And I asked, well, how do you think this is going to play in the West Bank? And the answer was, this is going to be a test. There'll be protests. But will people go wild? Will they upset the apple cart and so on? As you said, somebody throws a few grenades and so on. Well, they passed the test. They let themselves know. They said they didn't like it and so on. But they didn't ruin themselves. So I think that's important. And it seems to me even when things look bleak, it's important to stay engaged and keep working at it. People often tell you, don't, you can't, you can't reach a solution, so why get engaged? You have to keep engaged. I do have a cartoon left over from my days in office. I'd been in the area for about a week and a half peddling some ideas. And the cartoon appeared in the Jerusalem Post and it showed me fending off blows. There's a piece of paper on the floor that says Schultz Peace Proposals. And there's an Israeli with a club beating on me, and a Palestinian with a club beating on me, and a Jordanian with a club beating on me. And the caption says, well, at least they agree on something. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to have a thick skin and keep working on it. One of the uh, questions that does come up, and there have been a couple of studies on this, um, Tom Friedman, in fact, has talked about it repeatedly in his column in the New York Times. And that is when, um, when there is an Islamic instigated outrage against <clears throat> Islamic people, why aren't Islamic leaders screaming against that? Why is it that most of the time there is the outrage most of the time, it's against Islamic people done by Islamic fanatics, and Islamic leaders say nothing about this. How do you deal with that? But I actually think that there has been some which has allowed there to be uh, some action against Al Qaeda. Tell me about because, it. Because, well, there are more. We, I think we are making some progress against Al Qaeda. No, but which Arab like leaders are speaking out? I think that they have spoken out against violence against Muslims, that that has happened. The King of Jordan has done that. Um, the King of Jordan has on a number of occasions, but in Pakistan, for example, where this happens repeatedly, a couple of times a week we're reading about it, where is the leadership of the Muslim world in opposition to this kind of violence? Well, I, I think dealing with the Muslim world is one of the big issues that has to be yes. uh, dealt with. Right. And what has happened is President Obama has worked in, I mean, follow up on the Cairo suggestions that he made. He, I am now been asked to run something called Partners for a New Begin, Beginning of trying, we have to learn how to understand what Islam is about. We can't lump them all together. Uh, we need to understand, I, even the terminology we have is wrong. We talk about moderate Muslims. Moderate Muslims actually believe in moderate moderation passionately. So, you know, we, we don't have the right terms. And we have to find those leaders and support them that are, Fayyad is one of those, actually. I think yeah. that yeah. he is one of the people. I think that there are people in Pakistan that speak out, and we need to somehow not isolate them, but try to figure out how to figure who they are and how to proceed. Secretary Schultz. Actually, in Saudi Arabia, the government has done, as I understand it, a very effective job in cleaning out the Al-Qaeda that was starting to give them a lot of trouble. 
but a very impressive set of developments, as I understand it, has taken place in Indonesia, which has become uh, a, gov a country with a democratic government, which has had its uprising. You remember Bali, Jakarta, and so on. And they have managed to get a hold of it. They're reaching into the schools. They're going about it in a rather impressive way. So there are some good spots to look yeah. at. Let, let's take um, another moment now to remind our audience that you're all listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Our speakers today are former Secretaries of State, Madeleine Albright and George Schultz. We're discussing the challenges facing the nation. And I'm Marvin Kell. We have another question from the audience concerning U.S.-Russian relations. And the questioner asks that there's been this exchange of, of uh, quote, spies a few weeks ago. What did this spy exchange signify regarding U.S.-Russian relations? Is it perhaps a return to the Cold War? No, I think it signifies practically nothing. It signifies nothing. <laughs> these, these characters here, they, they didn't have the intelligence to know that they could get whatever they wanted off the Internet. <laughs> and it was kind of a layover, and I thought it was uh, handled quickly without a lot of kerfuffle. Absolutely. So it was positive. You were quoting Tom Friedman. He has a great column today about, you know, what are they looking for? What is this all about right. that it shows? But I think our relationship with Russia is fascinating, and many of us have spent our whole lives looking at it. And, um, and I think that there are those in Russia who would like to see us as an enemy, but the majority that uh, a lot of the leaders, a lot of the people within various aspects of Russian society realize that that is not the wave of the future. And, and I think that it behooves us to, to push on the reset, that it's a very good idea to see what relationships we can develop. What I love, though, is one of our uh, colleagues, Big Brzezinski, has great line that there are two camps in Russia. There's the Putin camp and the Medvedev camp, but the question is which camp Medvedev is in. <laughs> and so uh, we haven't quite sorted out how the relationships are evolving and what it is that the Russians feel will bring them into a responsible role in terms of managing the global system. Secretary Shields, let's talk for a little bit about Iran. Uh, we've been reading for years now that the Iranian regime is developing the capacity to have nuclear weapons. Um, a couple of questions. Do you agree, first of all, with that judgment? I don't think Sec there's the slightest doubt that they want to get nuclear weapons and are getting fairly close to getting them. Okay. That being the case, and the President of the United States and the Secretary of State having said repeatedly that this is something we cannot allow to happen. I agree with that. You agree with that, too. We are trying, the United States is trying, and I think many uh, members of the world community, to do something through the UN by virtue of sanctions, to do something that is not outright military force. Do you think that sanction regime can succeed in heading off a war? It can be effective, but I noticed when the director of the CIA was asked about that, he was skeptical that the sanctions would mean much. So I think it's a very hard problem. I don't know that some all-out assault is what's needed. Let me give an example of something going back to the Reagan period. Mm -hmm. We had a period where the Iranians were playing games with Kuwaiti shipping, trying to prevent it and so on from getting out of the Gulf. So we reflagged the ships. So they're our flag. When the president of Iran was in the United Nations making a speech saying, the last thing Iran would do would be to put a mine in the Persian Gulf. Our Navy was taking pictures of them doing it. Then we boarded the ship, 
took some mines off, took the sailors off, sank the ship, took the sailors to Dubai, and said to Iran, come and get your sailors and cut it out. It turned out to be reasonably effective communication. I think Iran has done all kinds of outrageous things and nobody calls their bluff. For instance, they, I read that they have little boats going around our capital ships in the Gulf. We should take them out. Take them out meaning destroy them. Destroy them. Because you have a right under self-defense. Look what happened with the USS Cole. These little boats can ram you and cause a lot of damage. And we just say we're not going to permit it anymore, and we don't permit it. And there's got to be some pushback. The Iranians had a huge outburst of protest. It was sparked by the phony election. But the reason for the protest was only partly of the election. The Iranian government has run their government terribly from the standpoint of the people. Inflation is way up there, 40, 50 percent. Unemployment is high. They're obviously not doing a good job for the people. The people know it. So we should be supporting the people who are expressing that point of view. And I think we should be broadcasting to them things like, your government is so preoccupied with their nuclear weapons program that all their good scientists and engineers are working on that. Meanwhile, your oil capacity is dwindling. You're not paying attention to it. Your refinery, you don't have the refining capacity to supply your own product. You've got plenty of crude, but no product. The refinery they have has got a lot of bailing wire in it. So we should be banging away. And uh, After the United States um, moved into Afghanistan in 2001, and after the United States moved into Iraq in 2003, do you believe that the United States is in a position in that part of the world to take military action against another Muslim state? Well, I think going back to the dates that you mentioned, it was interesting. Those were times when our, we were, seemed to be riding high. We were winning everything. And all of a sudden, the Iranians got very reasonable. And maybe we should have moved in very hard then to try to construct something. That might have been a missed opportunity. I, I agree. I think that we missed a time when we could have worked with them on dealing uh, with some of the issues on the Taliban and a variety of ways of, of uh, working. But nevertheless, that is what happened. I, I happen to think that the idea about the ships is a very good one. Uh, the problem that we have, we cannot... Um, there have been discussions about what a military option might be. We can't bomb our way um, out of the nuclear installations that they have. This is not like the uh, Iraq nuclear reactor that the Israelis took out, because in fact, we don't really know where everything is. Some of it is underground, some of it is in civilian, uh, among civilian populations. But to go back to my toolbox, I think we really do need to keep all the tools in play. And, um, and I do think that the sanctions uh, need to be really pushed and worked uh, because their economic situation is bad. What's interesting, again, there's a story today which says that some of the uh, merchants in the bazaars are striking because they don't like the idea that there's some new tax coming on. It is actually quite, this sounds like a weird thing to say, quite a democratic society in terms of what is going on there. So I agree that we need to be supportive of those that are um, disquieted by what the regime is doing. The problem is that even the most um, liberal people, if one can say this about those in Iran, are for Iran having the right to have a nuclear program, peaceful one. But they like the idea that the Persians are, in fact, going to be treated in a way of respect. Well, then you appear to envisage a world, if Secretary Schultz is right and they're going to go ahead and build a bomb, where we're going to have a nuclear-armed Iran 
I and don't envision that world. We're going to have to learn to live with it. I think that world would be a catastrophe because you would have not only Iran with nuclear weapons, but other states. There would be a proliferation. You mean throughout the entire region? And elsewhere. You're going in the wrong direction with that. And sooner or later, as more countries have these weapons, as countries who are clearly affiliated as Iran is, it's a, it's a big sponsor of terrorism, and a lot of fissile material lying around, you're going to wind up with a nuclear weapon going off somewhere. Do it means what? <laughs> Taking military action against Iran. Really push to get nuclear weapons under control, phased down, and ultimately out. And that means that you don't start by having another country like Iran get nuclear weapons. You stop them from doing it. Stop them by taking military action to stop them. I don't claim to know all the ins and outs, but I wouldn't be so confident uh, as um, Madeline seems to be that a military strike wouldn't have much of an impact. I think it could have a major impact. But uh, I don't know that, that you have to say it's that or nothing. For example, in working on this uh, nuclear issue, you say, what are the steps you need to take to get there? Well, one of them very clearly is to get control of the nuclear fuel cycle. People are building nuclear power plants around the world. You use enriched uranium or plutonium. If you can enrich the uranium for a power plant, you can enrich it for a weapon. That's the Iranian situation. And you can reprocess your spent fuel and get plutonium. Remember, the Nagasaki bomb was a plutonium bomb. So on a world scale, if we're going to have more nuclear power plants, we better get control of this fuel cycle. There has been considerable headway in that regard. The Sam Nunn's Nuclear Threat Initiative Group has worked on it very hard. Warren Buffett put up $50 million, and that drew a lot of governments to give money to set up a fuel bank and to try to work toward a situation where there is international control of all enrichment facilities. Now, if you had something like that in place, you could say to the Iranians, Okay, it's for peaceful purposes. Put it in the international setup. That means not just that you're going to have inspectors there, you're going to have people in the operation of the plant so we know that it's not, okay. there's not enrichment going on to weapons grade. So this is the kind of thing I think that should be worked at. Secretary Albright, um, there are obviously many different ways of handling this problem of the possibility of Iran developing a nuclear bomb. Secretary Schultz appears to be saying that one of those has to be recognized as the U.S. using military force to stop that from happening. Do you buy into that view of a settlement of the problem? First of all, I would not take the option off the table because having it on the table has a psychological impact. But I am not privy to uh, intelligence material that would indicate that a, a strike would actually accomplish what it is supposed to. What is terrifying is that the Iranians have possibilities of funding more Hezbollah and Hamas and terrorist organizations <laughs> that as a result of that, if one could set them back and it would not create this unintended consequence, I think it's a, it's, we are in a very difficult position because I fully agree with George that if we could get control of the nuclear fuel cycle, that would be the solution. It would be great to get rid of nuclear weapons. In the meantime, there are more countries that are working on nuclear programs. And so, the, and also, we just happen at the moment to have a crisis over oil. And uh, there are people that are building peaceful nuclear plants. I, my unintended consequences, Go back and listen to President Eisenhower's uh, Adams for Peace speech. How, how do you think all this really, you know, what is the process here? So we have to figure out a way to live with nuclear power. I believe that. And whether it's by getting control 
over the nuclear fuel cycle, that is the way to go. But I don't, we are in a very tough situation where we're not clear whether a military option in Iran would work without unleashing something that we couldn't control. Well, now, supposing the Israelis say, you guys keep on talking. You keep on talking. You keep on worrying. We're on the firing line, and we are going to take action. Now, in the recent Netanyahu-Obama conversation, that issue apparently came up. I have no idea what was said, but the issue came up. Now, would you, Secretary Schultz, sit on the Israelis and <laughs> try to stop them from taking military action against Iran? Well, look at Israel's position. They have Hezbollah supported by Iran, armed by Iran. The UN Security Council said Hezbollah should not rearm, meant nothing. They are rearmed. They have rockets that can hit Tel Aviv. They say they want to wipe out Israel. Iran says the same thing, repeatedly. Hamas in Gaza says the same thing. They want more weapons to fire at Israel. Iran supplies them. So Israel has a threat to its existence. No kidding. And I don't know why we don't learn when somebody repeatedly says they intend to do something to take them at their word mm -hmm. that they do. I don't know how much more they can do with Hezbollah. I mean, they've armed them, they do everything, they give them money and so on, and they're ready for some sort of assault without any doubt. The only reason it's held up, I think, is the last time they did it, Israel went back at them so hard that the Lebanese population says, wait a minute, you're bad news for us. So there's a certain deterrent capability there. But I think there's a, a threat to Israel's existence out there. And if you say Israel should just lie down and die, I don't think that's, that's a good posture. I'm not in favor of that. Secretary Albright, uh, on that same issue, do you feel that the United States should be leaning on Israel to stop even thinking about taking unilateral military action against Iran? I, you know, Israel is a sovereign, independent country that is under threat, and I don't think that the United States is in a position to tell them what to do. I do think that it goes back to one of the original questions you were asking here, which is how does this all go together? And therefore, pushing in terms of trying to get some solution on the Israeli-Palestinian issue is absolutely essential. Trying to figure out some way to have containment of Iran, because I am just not sure what the effects of bombing Iran is generally. You raised the question, are we prepared to have a third war with a Muslim country? That's right. And I think that people, we are not in office, so people that are, have to consider what the effects of all this is gonna be and whether there aren't other ways to go about dealing with this. Um, there might be some momentary satisfaction in bombing, but the question is where does it get you? And the arming of Hezbollah and Hamas, and Israel is living in a terrible neighborhood. Um, and the question is how, so w what has to be done is to work on these various other aspects of it before one basically says, you know, go for it. But I, I think that we don't have a right to tell Israel that is under existential threat, one would just hope that they would see the issue in a way that would not threaten them more. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm gonna ask you for answers that are very brief. Secretary Schultz, looking back on your time as Secretary of State, was there a big moment that passed that you wish you had grabbed? Because once it was passed, it ended up being a blunder for the U.S. No, we did everything just right, and I don't have to look back. You're not going to trap Think me that hard. way. Come on. 
No blunders at all. No blunders. No, no blunders. blunders. Secretary Albright. Obviously no blunders. No blunders. Were there. <laughs> Put her there, man. Was there one, was there a time? <clears throat> we, we know better than to fall for him. <laughs> was there a time, perhaps, when it was less of a success than you hoped? Our worst moment in the Reagan administration and for me, it was an awful moment, because I'm a Marine. Ah, uh, the 240. It was when the Marine barracks in Beirut were blown up by a suicide bomber. So that's one that I look back on and say, what could have been done? The military people look at it and say, well, the Marines didn't do anywhere a decent job of protecting themselves. In a neighborhood like that, they should have done better. On the other hand, maybe there's the diplomacy there. Yeah, but we could have, Mr. Secretary. You know very well. At that time, we could have, because we knew exactly who did it. We knew exactly where they were. President Reagan, in fact, was thinking about a retaliatory strike. It never happened. Well, the Secretary of Defense wouldn't do it. Weinberg would stop the president? He did. Yeah, well. However, Here's what I would have done, second-guessing myself. <laughs> we had the PLO. This is going to take a moment. Well, we don't have the moments, alas. <laughs> well, I, I have the solution, but you don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> That's television for you. <laughs> well, I tell you what, we could probably go on. Um, maybe we should. Maybe we should. Maybe we should. Um, my instinct tells me, Marvin, get off when you can. Um, but we do have only about three minutes left, and I'd like to ask you each question here. You have both watched presidents at work during intense times of national security crises, when there was a war or one was at hand. What is the quality, what is the characteristic of the president that on reflection you say that was absolutely essential that he had it? Secretary Albright. I think it is the capability of allowing people to disagree in front of him and to state their views very clearly and listening to them without a preconception and then being able to make up his mind. But I think that people that go in not knowing what they don't even know uh, don't have that capability. And the presidents that I worked for, I think, allowed there to be that kind of a discussion and did not feel threatened by it. So for me, that's the most important quality that's that is there. Secretary Schultz. I, I agree with that. But I also like it when they're, they're the uh, cool hands. They listen, they don't panic, they try to think it through, and uh, have a strategy. I think you always want to look for a strategy. In advance, that you, you know essentially what it is that you'd like to accomplish. You know that if I do this, there will be reactions to it, and how I'm going to do that, and so on, to have a strategic end that I'm looking for. So you don't get drawn into the business of, of some immediate response to a particular thing without thinking through the repercussions. I think next time we do this program, we're going to start with you giving us the answer <laughs> to the last essential question, your secret of getting to peace. But our time is up. And I want first to thank the secretaries, George Schultz and Madeleine Albright. I'd like to thank, please. <clears throat> Our wonderful audience here, all of those on radio, television, and the internet, this program has been co-sponsored by the Commonwealth Club of California, the United States Institute of Peace, and the Shorenstein Center on Press Politics and Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. I'm Marvin Calvin. As Ed Murrow used to say, good night and good luck.